Psalm 23, Psalm 23, the most well-known psalm in the scriptures. I'm reading it from the New King James Version. I have it memorized in the King James Version, and I really want to, I really wanted to preach in the King James, but I thought some of you new believers might really be like, when I start throwing out that Shakespearean language, you might get thrown for a loop. And so I, I'm, I'm bringing it to the New King James, which is very similar. And so here we are with the New King James, Psalm 23. And I'm going to read it, and I just want to encourage you, listen, follow along with me, and uh, let these words just sink down in your heart, because these words are the inspired, infallible, and errant Word of God. You can put your faith in them. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth, amen, my cup runs over. It's a beautiful picture, whatever translation you're looking at. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me or pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, amen. That is Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is a beautiful, beautiful psalm. It's, uh, it's as I said a couple of minutes ago, it is the, easily the most recognizable psalm. It's used all over the place, battlefields, hospital rooms. It's, it's, man, it's used all over the place. I don't even need to go into all the different ways it's used. But a lot of times familiarity with something kind of gives you a false sense of, of its actuality being exercised in your life. Um, and I want to just address that here in just a few minutes. Uh, I want to just ask you as we're reading that, Psalm 23, does it not just like give you the heart of a person who is at peace? I mean, that's really what it's showing. This is, by the way, in case you don't know, we know him as King David. We're introduced to him when he's a teenage boy, and he goes from being a shepherd boy out there keeping sheep to going into a battle where he goes out there and kills a a giant, and he gets put on the national scene at this point. And then he rises up and ultimately becomes the king of Israel and Judah, unites the kingdom, was a mighty, mighty warrior for God. Uh, Just a mighty warrior. Was a king for decades. Uh, He's writing this when he's older. But I, I know as he's writing this, he's looking back through his life at the faithfulness of God, and he's drawing the parallel of what it was like to be a shepherd boy when he was younger. And so he's writing this when he's older, reflecting on how good of a shepherd God has been to him. And so as, as we're looking at this, this is a guy who is calm. That, at least that's what's in the text. He's very calm. We, we sense that. We know that there's a, a sense of, of peace about him. We know that as we look at this, there's not only a, a calmness about him, there's a contentment about him. He's like, you know, as I said last week, the Lord is my shepherd, that's all I want. Because if you get the Lord, you get the Lord's goodness, and whatever comes with God, you know it's going to be good. He lacks nothing. And so there's a sense of contentment in David in Psalm 23. You pick that up. And not only that, but you, you get a real sense of confidence when you look at this because you've got a guy who's saying, you can walk me in the presence of my enemies and I'm at peace. If I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't even fear then. That's a, that's a confident man. I am totally confident. Let me ask you a question this afternoon. 
And if there's anybody watching online, there typically is a few people. I want to ask this question, and it's something I think we all need to answer. Does calmness, contentment, and confidence describe your spirit right now? Or does worry, discontent, and anxiety more describe where you're at? Now, I will tell you that uh, just because you get this right in one moment, you could come in here this Sunday and say, man, I'm, I'm doing good. Next Sunday, you could come in here and be like, man, I could punch somebody in the face right now. <laughs> like, I'm a nervous wreck. You know, I mean, everything just went wrong this past week, and you want to ask me how I'm feeling. <laughs> just help me. That's why I came to church. Well, I, I'm go- we, we're going to do that, all right? We're getting there. The reason that I'm asking the question is because I'll tell you, we all need this. We need to know Psalm 23. And here's the thing. The title of the message that I'm, I'm speaking to you today is how to, how to Experience the Power of God's Word. How to experience the power of Psalm 23 in your life. Because here's what I know. What I know is that it's great that you and I can look at Psalm 23 and see a lot of beauty in it. That's great. It's great that you and I can read Psalm 23 and really think about it. And and we can say, man, there's a lot of ability in that psalm to help me. Like, if I can get that in my soul, I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be helped out. It's great that you can see the beauty and you can understand the capacity. But your knowledge is not what this is about. My knowledge is not what this is about. My understanding of the text is not really what this is about. It's the experience of this text that this is about. This is about not only knowing this, but experiencing this. You can know all about the Bible and know all about God, but it do you no good whatsoever. Can I just tell you that there are, there are PhDs with, I mean, more degrees than you could imagine In ancient Hebrew and, I mean, all kinds of academic degrees that they've studied the Bible in its original languages and how it's changed history over the course of time, but they're not believers. It's not benefiting them from a faith perspective. And I'm telling you, their experience ought to be different from the experience of those of us that are in the pew. That are here because we're worshipers. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Then why in the world when I wake up at 2.30 at night, why does my mind still go down the wrong road? (laughs) I'm trying to retrain my brain. Miss Katie told me I shouldn't say this. We have a a nice lady in this church who wakes up at 2.30 and 3 and starts her devotional life. (laughs) I, I, she told me that. I said, I'll tell you, I think God's telling me to go back to sleep when I get up at, the, at that point. <laughs> I need to go back to sleep. God's saying, I didn't wake you up. And I sure didn't want you to think about that. So here's what I, 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 I want to ask you all. Take your phone out for just a quick minute. I'm going to give you a, a practical illustration of this. It's a practical, but it's going to illustration, but you won't forget it because it's so practical. Everybody open up your phone. Everybody open up your phone. Now turn the ringer off. Now put it back in your pocket. <laughs> no, that's not what I was telling. <laughs> that's not the illustration. Okay, here, here's what. That was a good trick, wasn't it? it sounded like I was going somewhere with that. <laughs> but I, I, I really am. Okay, so on your phone, how many of you have apps on there you don't use? I was thinking about this week just how many apps I may have on my phone that I don't know how to use or even, you know, I don't know even why they're there. And I started going through there, and I'll just do this right here in front of you guys. Are you all ready to do this little exercise with me? 
Yeah? Well, if you're not, that's all right. It'll be about 30 seconds. I'm looking at my phone right now in front of you. I don't know why here I have on my phone an app called Freeform. Does anybody else have Freeform on your phone? Is that an Apple thing? Yeah? It just showed up one day. It's an intruder. Okay? Freeform. I have no idea how this ended up on my phone. Then I've got another one down here called Journal. Journal. I don't know why I have Journal on my phone. Then there are shortcuts. How many of you all have shortcuts on your phone? Isn't that amazing? How many of you use shortcuts? Three of you. That's awesome. So we're all needing to delete shortcuts. Here's a shortcut to cleaning your phone up. So I've got um, numbers. I would never put that on my phone. I've got another one on here that I never use, NFL fantasy football. I've never used that. I don't play fantasy football. Uh, I have several on here that I don't use. Let me tell you, look at your phone right now. How many of you have apps on your phone you don't use? Why? Now, here's the thing. Somebody spent a lot of time and a lot of energy, and they used their talents, their knowledge to put all that on their phone, not only to make money off of you and off of me, But their aim, I imagine, was to make life more efficient for you. And if we know anything about Americans, we will buy some efficiency. (laughs) Right? We will spend some money on some efficiency and then forget that we spent that money on that efficiency. I I just want you to know I didn't pay for any of those. (laughs) But here's the reason that I bring this up. I have all kinds of opportunity on my phone to make my life more efficient. I have apps. I have opportunity. What I don't have is intentionality. Let me tell you something. That right there is one thing. We've got all kinds of abilities right here to make a difference in our lives, and it's not making much of a difference in mine. I don't know about yours. What's even more sad is that this right here we have And this has crazy, life-changing, world-changing, life-giving power. And if we're not using it, and we're not experiencing it, it's it's about as much good for us as that app that I'm not using. You following me? So here's where I'm going with this. Everybody turn your phone off, please. (laughs) Done with the goofy little illustration. You could use that in many different ways. That illustration, you know and I know that the goal of of the Word of God is not just knowledge. It's not information God's looking for. It's transformation. He's wanting us to be transformed into the image of His Son so that we can move out into the world and be His hands and His feet and His mouth. He wants us to display the heart of God around the world because the world needs His love and His grace. You believe that? Okay. Well, here's what I want to do. I want to help you experience, not just understand, Psalm 23. So here's what I want to do. I want to break it down into two sections, and the second one is very experiential. The first one, I want to give you three things that the Good Shepherd gives us. Three things the Good Shepherd gives us based on Psalm 23. The first thing that David writes about, inspired by the Holy Spirit that the good shepherd gives is his provision. He gives us his provision. David said in verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. By the way, the best word in that whole psalm, the sweetest word in that whole psalm, Charles Spurgeon said, is the word my. Because you can talk all the theological and biblical truth about God you want to, but if you, don't, if you can't say he's my shepherd, it's just information. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, I will never be in lack. And then he goes on in verse 2, and he writes this. He says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. 
What David is writing about in this particular passage shows us that if God is your good shepherd and you are his sheep and you own that, then what that means is that God will provide for you what you need when you need it. God will provide for you what you need when you need it. I believe, I've experienced over time, that God doesn't give you what you need before you need it. Very much. And I've also discovered that a lot of times God will not just give you what you need. He'll give you more than you would even want or ask for. Because He's just that good. So there's a balance in here. God will give you what you need when you need it. A lot of times He'll give you more. Sometimes you'll find that He doesn't give it before you need it though. And here's what David is writing here. When he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Imagine the shepherd leading the sheep. What he's doing is he's found the good pasture. And he's going down there and he's taking them where there is good grass for them to eat. He takes them down there and he makes them lie down. Ultimately, what he's doing is he's making them rest. I want you to eat. I want you to rest. I I don't want us to rush through this. I want, to, I want you to slow it down. This is not a drive-through experience. This is a feasting experience. This is, a, this is something that I want you to chew on. By the way, how many of you have heard that cows, uh, they not only eat food, but then once they eat it, they spit it back up and then they chew on it? Then they swallow it again. They, I mean, several times over, they spit their food up, and they chew on it again, and they swallow it. Isn't that a great thought? <laughs> I don't know if you know this or not, but sheep supposedly have the same sort of digestive system. Well, here's what I will tell you. What we know, what David is talking about here, is that God will provide for us the food, the sustenance we need, the strength that we need to go where we need to go and to do what we need to do. That's what David is saying here. And then he says, but God will also lead us beside still waters. And when he says that, what he's talking about is he's talking about a God who will take you to a place where there's not going to be just a waterfall coming down and you can't drink it. He's not going to take you to some stagnant pool that's filled with mosquitoes and nastiness. He's going to take you to a good place to get clean water that's good and refreshing for your soul. And just so you'll know, I think that means that God's going to take care of your provision physically, and God's also going to take care of your provision spiritually. God is going to take care of you. Isn't that good news? How many of you have been through something where if somebody would have told you five years before or five weeks before you were going to go through that, you would have said, I will never make that. I will fail that test. I will kill somebody. And then lo and behold, the test came and God gave you grace for that moment. That's God giving you grace when you need it. And here's a lesson to take from this. When it says that God will make you lie down in green pastures, it's really better if, if you take that word make and you, and you understand he's, he's taking you somewhere. He's wanting you to sit down and learn. But the reality is it's better if he doesn't have to make you. You just volunteer. Because he knows how to make you. And he know, he, I can tell you from personal experience, he's, he's made me lie down in some green pastures. God provides whatever you need in order to do what God wants you to do. God will give you what you need in that hour. Thank Him. Praise Him for His provision. I have served the Lord with my wife over 28 years now, and here's what I know. He's been faithful every step of the way. He's called us to sacrifice. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know how we're going to make it. I don't know how this is going to come to pass. And then lo and behold, He just... Out of nowhere, things happen. I can't wait to share some of the testimonies with you. But I want you to fully understand and experience this for yourself, that we have a God who is a providing God. What do you need? He is the answer. He is your provider. If it is God's will, I heard a preacher say last week, 
it will be God's bill. God will, God will give you, God will provide for you what you need to, to get through where, wherever you've got to go. Whatever you've got to accomplish, if God wants you to do it, he's going he's gonna to make sure you've got what you need in the moment to get through it. Are you with me? So that's point number one. Our God is a providing God. And here's what we need to learn next. God is a God who is able and willing and always ready to give us restoration. The good shepherd gives us not only provision, he gives us restoration. The first part of verse 3 says, he restores my soul. He restores my soul. When you look at this, um, Psalm 23 it's, it's hard to really comprehend for a lot of us because we didn't, we're not familiar with shepherd and sheep and all that kind of stuff. But there was a man named Philip Keller. Uh, I would encourage everybody to get this book. It's a small book, Philip Keller, Psalm 23, A Shepherd Explaining Psalm 23. It is a wonderful book. Um, but in that book, Philip Keller, who was a shepherd, he, he writes this. He says, there are four things that have to take place before a sheep will lie down and rest. The sheep must be free of fear from predators, free of tension from within the flock, free of flies or parasites. Remember a couple of weeks ago I was talking about nose flies? And, well, that's something that sheep need in order to sleep well. Uh, They need to be cared for by a good shepherd. And then lastly, they need to be free from hunger. They're not going to sleep well if they're hungry. But a good sheep will keep the she- shepherd will keep the sheep free from the fear of predators, tension within the flock, flies or parasites, and free from hunger. You see, a good shepherd is going to calm the fears of his sheep. He's going to bring unity to the flock. He's going to treat the animals for insects, and he's going to lead them to good pastures. He's going to make sure you've got places to find your contentment because you're satisfied. You've got the food and the water that you need. We serve a God who's in the restoration business. Now, your soul right now may be a little worn, tattered, and listen to me, I know this This is in my heart to share because I know myself at times, I have felt like my attitude has been bad. I've I've struggled with something. I've I've done something. I'm like, I'm struggling. I just, you know, I want God to forgive me and cleanse me. And when I think about restoration, what I want God to do is what David talks about in another Psalm, in Psalm 51, where David says, restore unto me, Lord, the joy of my salvation. See, he wrote that in Psalm 51 after he had committed adultery. He lied. He basically lined up a murder. I mean, David did all those things, and he asked the Lord to forgive him and to cleanse of his his sins. And then he also says, but restore to me, Lord, the joy of my salvation. I want you to know we have a God in the restoration business. He's in the restoration business. When you think about this passage of Scripture, I want you to know God specializes in bringing you and I back to a place where we need to be in our relationship with Him. You know what David wrote in Psalm 119, verse 67? If any of you are struggling in here in your conscience because of a bad attitude or you've tripped up in a sin, if you're struggling because you don't know like where you stand in your relationship with God, listen to me now. If you don't know, Here's what David said, especially if you're feeling right now like, man, I'm sitting under conviction. I'm I'm, I'm unsettled in my spirit. There have been tough things happening, and I'm wondering if it's God. Well, God's always trying to get our attention. God is always with us, and we need to know it's just this simple. Turning to the Lord and saying, thank you, Lord. You restore my soul. David said in Psalm 119, verse 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. Do you know what David is saying? Lord, you sent affliction into my life to get my attention. In Psalm 119, verse 71, David said this, It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your word. Are you all with me? 
The idea here is that God restores us. God wants to restore us. God wants us to live in life, in an abundant life. But we have to know He's a God who wants to do that. He's not hesitant about it. He's happy to do it. Say this with me. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. He's in the restoration business. You may feel broken down, beat up. You may feel like you're over in a ditch. You may feel like you've started going backwards. You may feel like everybody is passing by. Life's going by. You should have been here. And what's happened to you? And all this... All these kind of things going through your head. Please listen to this. Your life is not over and you serve a God who is miraculous. You serve a God who's in a restoration mode. At any moment, you and I will call out to him. Praise his holy name. He can take you, whatever mess you may be in, and he can make your life as good as new. Will there be scars? Yes. But that's just character. <laughs> Will there be things that you got to deal with? Yes. But that's just something you can use in your arsenal to help somebody else down the road. There is nothing wasted about your life. You serve a God who can make you better than you were when you started. And however far you thought you ought to be right now, I just want you to know you're wasting time thinking about where you should be and you need to put your eyes on the Lord and just say, God, I want to go where you want me to go. I want to be where you want me to be. And there's nothing on earth, there's nothing in hell that can stop me from getting where you want me to go or being who you want me to be because he is a God who restores souls. Let him build you up. Let him clean you up and let him set you on that path afresh and anew. You are not beaten down. You're not too far gone. That's a lie from the pits of hell. He is here for you even this very moment. He's in the restoration business. He's in the provision business. The, and thirdly, he's in the direction business. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Praise his name. He leads us for his namesake to think about him leading us in paths that we know will be right. And he has attached his name to you and me making the right choices and doing the right thing. You don't have to worry about it. You pray you seek the Lord, you seek counsel, you spend time in his word, and here's what he promises. He will lead you and he will lead me in the path of righteousness. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. My sheep know me and they know my voice and they follow me. I want you to know today, you don't serve a God who's far off. You serve a God who's with you. And every single day, he wants to speak. Every single day. He wants to give you direction. You don't have to live confused. There's so much that I want to say. But let me help you experience this. How do you experience this? So those are the truths. How do you experience it? Number one, you pray. You pray through this psalm. Pray it. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. You are my provider. When I look at this psalm, I say, Lord, I see in here that you are the Lord who provides for me. You are Jehovah Jireh. You, Lord, you, you, you make me lie down and you lead me beside the still waters. You restore my soul. That means he is a pardoning God. He gives me peace. That means he's Jehovah Shalom. He restores my soul and he leads me in paths of righteousness. Righteousness means in, in, in the paths of holiness. That means he is Jehovah Tzidkenu in the original language. That means that he's going to take me where I need to go and I don't have to live confused and in doubt and in worry. I don't have to be in that space. I can live with confidence. 
I, I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You all get this now. I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And he says in here, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he is Jehovah Nisi. He is the Lord, my banner, which means if he is with me, if he is there, it doesn't matter what the enemy wants to do because I've got God with me. I have nothing to fear. There's not a man, a woman, an army on the planet that you or I have to fear if God is with us. And if God be for us, who cares who's against us? It just doesn't matter. Lord, and that's why David goes on. It's like he just starts going. He's, Lord, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. And so what David is doing here is he's putting this out there. And here's how you use this. You sit down in prayer and you say, God, I need direction. Lord, I thank you that you are going to direct me. Your word says, Lord, you will direct me. Your word promises in the Old Testament and New Testament, you will direct my steps. You pray through there. You say, Lord, you, you restore my soul. I thank you, Lord. I, I messed up earlier today. But Lord, I can go to bed tonight and not worry about if I die, am I going to wake up in heaven or hell? I don't have to worry about that. Why? Because I know this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, your word is so clear that I am clean. I am forgiven. I have the blood of Jesus covering my sin. I am standing before God in the very righteousness of Christ. Lord, it blows my mind that you don't hold against me all of my sin. But Lord, you said in your word, you don't. Do you hear what I'm saying in everything that I'm mentioning? You said in your word, Lord. You've promised direction. You've promised provision, Lord. And you've promised, Lord, that you would restore me when I need you. You pray the Lord's word. Guys, are you praying the Lord's word? You know how you can know that God's going to say amen to your prayers if you're praying his word? Pray his word back to him. Another thing I want to mention, these last two very brief. Another thing that I want to mention is not just prayer, but praise. Because you can't pray through that without giving praise to him. Start thinking about all the times that God has done this for you in the past. Think about the times that God has directed you in the past. Think about the times you wanted to go one way. It didn't work out. You ended up going another way. And you thank God that you didn't go that way, but you went that way. Think about the times that you lacked and God provided Think about the times God protected you when you couldn't protect yourself. Think about all those times. Praise Him for it. Praise Him for it. There's power in your praise. Something happens not only when you pray, but when you pray faith-building prayers. I can't stand praying with people who pray defeated prayers. I'm just going to be honest. Can I be carnal and real with y'all for a minute? I don't, I used to, pr we used to have people that we would pray with and I would tell Jessica, I'm like, gosh, I, what do I do here? I'm like, D is God, why are we talking to God if he's not bigger than my problem? And every, pr like, I felt like everything we were asking for, they were giving God an out in case he didn't, in, in case he didn't answer according to the request and on the time they thought he should answer so they're saying but God if it should be your will and listen I'm always for praying in the will of God but if you're praying the word of God you're praying the will of God do you understand in context in context but I, I want you to understand sometimes you when you're praying in the middle of your prayer you have to attach your prayer with praise to, because in that time when you're talking to the Lord, that's the thing you need to raise your expectation. Jesus walked down into Nazareth in his hometown to do a bunch of miracles. And it says in uh, Mark chapter 6 that he couldn't do many miracles among them because of their unbelief. I wonder how many blessings God has had for me. How many blessings God has had for you. But he didn't and he couldn't give them because I didn't believe him. The, 
The distance between the request and the answer oftentimes is actually praying in faith, believing God. And then lastly, we're going to proclaim. It's really funny. I close this with this kind of, I told Jessica, I said, there's like this thing that's going on in churches now. Please, if you do this, please know I mean no offense whatsoever. It just took me a while to understand what was going on. Y'all know church people can be some funny creatures every now and then, right? And I started hearing people talking about, I declare and I decree. And I'm like, decree? you decree? I'm like, have, do you never, I, like, do you never leave the four walls of a church? Because nobody on planet earth is decreeing anything anymore. <laughs> Are you all? Okay, just follow me because this sounds rough right now. I got a correction in my spirit. All right, now watch. Watch where I'm going with this. Here's what they're doing that I had to learn. What they're doing is they're taking the word of God and they're verbalizing it and they're saying, this is true. And it's true because the king of heaven said it's true. Um, wow. So I'm going to go around declaring and decreeing now. <laughs> or I should anyway. I'm still getting used to it. I've got a devotional that at the end of a devotional reading, it has a little prayer. It writes out a prayer for you. And I, I, sometimes I, you know, I go through that prayer because it's beautiful. But then at the end, the thing I really love is that confession. They're confessing. Like, I confess, Lord, I'm an overcomer today. I confess, Lord, today, I'm the head, not the tail. I confess in all these things. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm, <laughs> I'm decree. I, I'm proclaiming God's truth. Let me tell you the value of that. Just like David in Psalm 23, he's not filled with worry. He's calm. He's filled with contentment, and he's not murmuring. And he's filled with confidence instead of doubt because he's declaring the word of God over his life with strength. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to declare the word of God over our lives. We've got to do it over our kids. We've got to do it over our spouses. We've got to do it over our church. We've got to declare the truth of God's word. Are you all with me? 60 more seconds. Promise, Wesley, go ahead. The floor will fall out if I don't finish. Three years ago, when COVID was really rough, my dad has every underlying condition you could imagine. He's diabetic, COPD, he's a Vietnam vet with all the Agent Orange, everything you could have in your lungs, and he had cancer. He's 73. And all the muscles that used to be in his arms and shoulders, they're right there now. You know, it's all. <laughs> so every underlying condition that they were saying we should be concerned about, my dad had it. Well, he ends up going into the hospital with COVID. My mother gets COVID. My dad ends up with double pneumonia. And you all know how that story played out. It's like it's complications from COVID and all of this stuff. And my dad's got all these things going on. And I'm just, I'm a wreck. And when I had gone to Tennessee to see them, and it was horrible. And I remember pulling over on the side of the road, and I not only called my wife, and, and said, what should I do? Like, I'm a, I feel like I'm five years old right now. And I feel like I, I'm like, I'm having an anxiety attack on the interstate. Literally pulled over at a gas station. I'm like, I, I don't even know what to do. My heart's racing. I called them and then I called my pastor. Here's what my pastor said. I told him all the stuff and he said, Eddie, you just have to apply the word. I'm sitting there listening. And I'm like, you better do better than that. <laughs> there was nothing to add to it. Because I knew what he meant. I need to pray the word. I need to praise God for the word. And I need to proclaim the word of God. There was nothing I could do in that moment. And the only thing that was going to calm me down was the good shepherd. 
And so I determined that that moment, I said, Lord, I don't need to just know what I know because I've got a lot of education in the Bible. I need to experience your word. And I'm going to tell you, it changed my situation like that. Now, I had to do it again over and over and over. But whatever you're going through, he's a good shepherd. And he's here for you. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? At the end of the service, before we dismiss, we're going to have a prayer team that's up here. And uh, there's three or four of our mature believers that will be up here ready to pray for you. And I don't want anybody leaving here today without getting the prayer support you need. If you have a specific request and your heart's burdened and heavy, I want you to come up here and pray with them. But there's something else I want to say. I'm going to cover you in prayer. And whatever's going on in your life, I will give you the same advice my pastor gave me. Apply the word. Apply the word. Get in the word. Get the truth. And apply it by faith. Apply it by faith. Don't let it be like an unused app on your phone. Apply it by faith. If you're in here today and you've never given your heart to the Lord Jesus, He is the Good Shepherd. He came and He laid down His life so that you and I could have all that we'll ever need. He lived a sinless life, died on the cross, and He went back to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit in His absence to be with us until we get home. If you've never given your heart to Him, right now would you open up your heart and give it to Him? I want to encourage everybody, pray this prayer with me. And if you would, pray it out loud. If you've never given your heart to Christ, He's here today. Pray this with me. Meet it in your heart. And He will hear from heaven. And He will forgive your sin and put the Holy Spirit in your heart to fill you with His goodness. Pray this with me. Say, Dear Lord, I admit my sin to you. I'm so sorry. I believe Jesus died for me. I believe Jesus is alive and is my good shepherd. And I commit my life to you this very moment. I confess to you that on my own, I am dead in my sin. But through faith, I'm alive in Jesus. Thank you for the gift of life and forgiveness through Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I love you, Lord. Heads bowed and eyes closed. If you just prayed and gave your heart to Jesus, would you raise your hand real high? Would you raise your hand real high? Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen. Amen. Wow. Would those of you that raised your hand, would you look at me real quick? I just want you to know the Lord hears you, sir. He loves you. He loves you. It's so real. Can't see it, but that knocking on your heart, your heart beating, that's the Holy Spirit. Young man, I want you to know that's the Holy Spirit. He loves you with an everlasting love. And I want you to know He will never leave you and He will never forsake you. Thank you. I want you to know you're my brother today. You're part of the family of God. Here's what I want to say. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're part of this family. We want to be here for you. Before you leave today, we've got people that will connect with you. My wife's going to come up and close us out. But can we all put our hands together and give the Lord praise?